two minutes. So it is our great pleasure to welcome Professor Eric Gold to this workshop on reservoir computing. Uh, he's the W. John Harrington Professor of Mathematics at Clarkson University, and he's the director of the Clarkson Center for Complex Systems Science. So it's very appropriate that he's working, that he's speaking for complex systems and dynamics for our center. Uh, he was his PhD from the University of Colorado, who is with Professor Jim Mice, who is a very well-known dynamical systems expert. And his research interests, they lie in the data-driven analysis of complex systems and dynamical systems, machine learning and data science methods, and in network science, all of which, of course, feed into reservoir computing. And therefore, it's hardly a surprise that he's one of the recognized experts on reservoir computing and also has pretty well-known review articles on this. So he's the perfect person to speak in this workshop. So it's my pleasure to welcome him. Uh, Eric, what title did you want to give you? Maybe you could just tell us. <laughs> or, I forgot the exact title, but maybe the title of this this paper, which was my first paper, this is the the main theme. I have actually bits of all of these, but on this explaining the success of reservoir computing uh, paper from chaos from uh, 2021. That's probably the title. Okay, so maybe you could just go ahead and start. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for having me. And um, this is my... Uh, this is my farthest away ever conference, as you can see from the fact that a straight line is actually a uh, um, a, a great circle uh, as the geodesic. <laughs> so I often put these um, these little things so you can see where I am relative to where you are, and I'm all the way on the opposite side of the world, clearly. So we're up here in upstate New York. So people here in New York, and they think we're in New York City, which is down here. It's a seven and a half hour drive. We're actually right next to Canada. So in this picture, Right where my cursor is, that's Canada. <laughs> so here we are. I'm sitting right here at my house, and here's the university. Um, and uh, I bet you have different weather from us, but we have snow today. <laughs> and we have chilly weather, 20 degrees. <laughs> oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have 20 degrees too, but it's Fahrenheit. <laughs> right. uh, so anyway. This uh, talk is essentially on why does reservoir computing work or how, how can I understand how it works on explaining the success. There's some connections to some other well-known um, classical methods of forecasting analysis, data-driven analysis of dynamical systems. Um, VAR, which is vector autoregression, and DMD, which is dynamic mode decomposition that um, I uncovered with a particular twist on the concept. So, you notice I use the phrase data-driven dynamical systems or data-driven science, which is inferring things about the dynamical systems from observing dynamics, which has been kind of a, a, a large theme transitioning in the, I think, the general field of dynamical systems from since when I started, when it was more so about analysis of dynamical systems. And uh, following this paper, which was um, essentially my pandemic paper, um, I saw... I'd been hearing about um, reservoir computing for about five years before I touched it. And uh, it seemed like a bit of a gimmick. The idea of a random neural net might do something useful for you. Um, but then I saw Ed Ott talk about it um, in uh, December of 2020. And he was really like um, uh, forward and saying it works really well. And I trust him tremendously. So I said, I gotta try this thing. And he also said something else about reproducing the attractor which is about good errors. And I'll show you that in a minute. So I decided to try it on my way home over the Atlantic. I thought I'd get it started. I programmed the whole thing up from scratch in about ten, um, about an hour, which was shocking to me because normally these things, you have all sorts of parameters to tune and it's much harder than it seems. And this was just the opposite. There were essentially no parameters to tune. It worked right out of the box immediately and it worked fantastically well. And then I decided I need to figure out how this thing works. And this paper, which is kind of long, I wrote the whole thing from front to back, the whole, all the analysis, all the simulations. In the three weeks, we were all locked in the house because of the pandemic. So I always think this is my pandemic paper. Um, and it was it was mostly explaining why it works. But then uh, a friend of mine, Dan Gauthier, 
um, and I were talking following that. And about a year later, we we used the methods in here to make a greatly improved version we call Next Generation Reservoir Computing. That'll be in here too. There's some bits about um, random projection. And here is a student who recently um, uh, graduated um, talking about something very closely related, random projection or DMD methods. And all of this um, is influenced by my take on, on evolution operators. DMD is an evolution operator, it's a Koopman operator, estimator. For Binney's Prawn Operators, it's adjoint. That's all in this old book of mine. Um, so here we go. Can I change slides? Something's wrong. Oh, yes, I can. So a reservoir computer, um, RC, is a kind of neural net for forecasting dynamical systems. Um, unlike most um, artificial neural nets, which have millions of parameters, and so does this perhaps, most of them you just choose randomly, which seems kind of bizarre. Um, so clearly it's cheap to just choose most of the parameters randomly compared to going through the computational effort of training the, um, the many parameters. Um, but I'll give you an idea of, of how I told you this five years before I actually started working around with it. I thought it was a bit of a gimmick, so I didn't touch it. Now I think it's uh, fantastically interesting. But I'll tell you the whole field of neural nets. Um, I first started noticing it about 25 years ago as a student. And as of about 20 years ago, I decided um, I didn't want to bother with it because it would it's not a really good idea. There's too many parameters. You're overfitting. <laughs> and I was wrong there too, obviously. So anyway, with millions of parameters um, to train, it's no, it's no surprise that a neural net's very expensive to train. And that's why I thought neural nets would never go anywhere back in the day, because I had no imagination for how fast and how powerful our computers would get with all the GPUs and so forth. And there's all sorts of excellent technologies like stochastic gradient descent and so forth that have come to fore. So you can actually train a large neural net, but a recurrent neural net is particularly difficult to train, which is what a RC is. It's a kind of recurrent neural net. Um, but we don't bother training it. We just choose most of the parameters randomly, and we only train a few of the parameters, the output parameters. And we do it in a way where the training is simple. It's just least squares. So it's just matrix operations. So it's no surprise that it's cheap. What surprises that it actually works. And it doesn't just work, it works fantastically well. Um, so this talk isn't about the neat things that you can do with reservoir computing. This talk about is really about how it works, why it works, and some bridge equivalents to some, some other things. So it was invented in 2001 by Jaeger. There's a related, very close related thing called Echo State Network. And it was improved by Jaeger and Haas in 2004. So it's been around a little while. So this is something I, I do sometimes, which is I show you a bit of the conclusion before I get into the middle. So I'll conclude, it works really well. This could be my ending slide. Um, it concludes really well, and it uses drastically less data than uh, a typical neural net because you're training a lot less parameters. It takes the more parameters you have to train, the typically the more data you're going to need to train them in a reasonable way. So also the fact that we're using um, less, we're training less parameters allows us to train it with less data. It turns out um, a linear RC with a nonlinear readout, which is the the, the modification I'm going to make to it. I'm going to make an out. A lin a, an RC with a linear activation function, but a nonlinear readout, which is a legitimate version of an RC. It's equivalent to an NVAR, which stands for nonlinear vector autoregression. And this leads to um, a, an improved version I'm going to call NGRC. It's also equivalent to DMD, but that's not on this one. So what's a VAR? A VAR is equivalent to a VMA. So a vector autoregression is equivalent to a vector moving average which um, follows um, a classical representation theorem by Wold. So what this does for me is it tells me that if I'm looking at a particular kind of, of time series, that this representation exists by the Wold theorem. And since this representation var exists, then this line tells me that an RC will, um, will exist. So it tells me before I start that I, I have right to try to look for an RC that will model my data. And this is what I mean by model the data. So this, everyone likes to play around with um, the Lorentz equations, the Lorentz 63 model. So this is a Lorentz 63 ODE, three ODEs, X, Y, Z, um, projected into X and Z for a 2D picture. You get this classic butterfly. 
in blue. And um, here's the time series for the three time series. And uh, the reservoir computer that I described, this one, is trained to the data. And in training phase, the training is exact, essentially perfect. <clears throat> the date the, the reservoir is able to exactly reproduce the data, at least up to the pixelation. So you see the red curve is on top of the blue curve. But um, that just says you can train it. It might be, in, might be sensitive, but it turns out it's not too sensitive because in testing phase, um, starting with the same initial conditions, and then you just feed the output of the reservoir back into the reservoir and let it run. Um, it forecasts for quite a long time before you see any noticeable error. So the red and the blue, the blue is uh, blue is true. That's kind of a thing I do. Red is the forecast. And you can see the line top of each other through essentially several Lyapunov times. And then you, once the error starts, um, you can see the difference between them. And that's really the best you can hope for, because you remember, even if I gave you the exact ODE, and then I went to a numerical integrator like Runge Cutter 45, and I use a small step size, um, I'll see essentially the same behavior, which is um, the forecast and the true will diverge exponentially, um, lie on top of each other for a while, and then soon you'll see a difference. That's just an expression of sensitive dependence to initial conditions, because it's a chaotic system. Um, What's surprising about the reservoir computer is once it makes errors, it makes good errors. And by good errors, I mean, you see the data it produces, the red, looks very realistic. So it's still producing the, a Lorenz butterfly-like object. So the phrase that people say to describe this property is you say it reproduces the climate. So I take that to mean if you're forecasting the weather and you're forecasting um, Say tomorrow's weather, you get it right. Say it's going to be 65 degrees. It's going to be partly sunny and uh, with uh, uh, moderate winds. That That's a good forecast. But 10 days out, if I'm forecasting, the weather is going to be 75 degrees, cloudy, maybe with some drizzle, and winds are going to be 25 miles per hour. And that's wrong. At least it's realistic weather. But if I'm forecasting the weather um, 10 days out, it's going to be 415 degrees. Um, it's going to snow 12 feet. Um, that starts becoming unrealistic weather. So if I start seeing the forecast going to infinity or flat lines, that would be unrealistic forecast. So it's not reproducing the climate. The technical way to say it is, see this attractor? I'm actually reproducing the invariant measure. And that's one way to test your um, as an, uh, an objective function. So the invariant measure has... Um, you're reproducing the attractor with the right kind of statistics. Okay, so in summary, NGRC is simple. It's much less data hungry. It takes less data than you would think. Look at this small data set. I'm training on this small data set. And yet, I've already reproduced the attractor. I'm not reproduce, I'm not training on um, hundreds of thousands of points. It has very few parameters to train, and it's very flexible in feature selection. Okay, here we go. So what is an RC? I think we've heard already what an RC is generally, but I'm going to speak it in my language. Um, why, I'm talking about why it works, and there's all sorts of random parameters. So this is the kind of picture you often see in neural nets. I'm going to switch my, see if I can switch my pointer to a laser pointer. That looks nicer than my pointer. Here we go. So um, you feed in your natural data by some read-in matrix, is a linear read-in matrix. I'll, I'll, I'll write in symbols in a minute. Um, and then you have um, a new representation of the data in terms of R variables. And the R variables influence each other in a manner that's represented by this network. Um, and then you um, continuously read out data by a readout matrix. So you have three sets of matrices, a read-in matrix, a, a internal matrix that updates the internal variable, and a readout matrix. The fact that you have arrows pointing back um, to the other values inside this network means this is not essentially the classic feed-forward neural net, but it's essentially, a, it's a recurrent neural net. It's these arrows that don't feed from left to right. It's not a bipartite graph. Um, so these variables, x, these are of the size of your natural dynamical system. So for Lorentz, it would be x, 1, 2, 3 for the x, y, z. 
And the readout, you can make this any size you want for any observable you want, but typically you choose it to be the same size as the X's. So this would be X, Y, Z also, but at a next time step. But there's a lot of applications where you play around with this, both by maybe making a next time step or other observables or control um, targets or whatnot. Um, so we'll talk on that in a second. So I'll show an equivalence, a logical bridge to the NVAR. So NVAR is a variant of VAR. It's a nonlinear vector autoregression, which is a star from econometrics. And it dates back to the 1950s, 1960s, and also to Koopman. Oh, I want to point out there's a, um, a notable literature where some of the gra same ground was um, covered, but in a very slightly different context, and one not with a connection to, um, to RC, by um, an English fellow named Billings, and he was calling these narcs, what I'm calling um, NVAR. So here's the classical reservoir computer. So give me a lot of data. So vector valued X, give me N samples in R dx. So remember, dx is three for Lorentz. And xi would be samples of that time series. So in the previous slide, this would just be slices through this. So one x would be one time slot, one time selection, x of t, y of t, z of t, that would be one xi. Give me a bunch of those, and then read them in as a u by a read-in matrix. This read-in matrix won't be square, this guy, this reading matrix will be dr by dx. dr is typically much larger than dx. So if dx is like three, dr might be like a thousand. So this is a thousand by three matrix. So it's a linear reading. So it just essentially changes the um, linear combinations of the data in random combinations of what this amounts to. Um, then once I have a u, I'm going to use the U and add it to some combinations of internal states of the reservoir, the R's. So these need to be the same size. A will be a square matrix, um, and R's are the internal state. So typically you choose the first R to be zero, although that's not necessary, but you choose it to be zero, which is a warm-up phase. And um, once it's read in, you can think of this as like having a memory associated with pa past values of R, and I'll be more explicit with this as time comes. Um, and then maybe an offset. So after you do that, you hit it with a, uh, or you um, compose it to a activation function. Um, typical activation functions in neural nets may include the hyperbolic tangent, sigmoid function, a ReLU function is very um, uh, common. Um, and so this is what typ people typically choose. I'm going to skip that and essentially choose a uh, identity function, which is equivalent to just say skipping the queue. Um, and what initially motivated me to do that is just to see what was the role of this thing. Because as you know, a, a, um, a, a tang function has a, a, a picture that looks like this blue curve. And if I can just keep the S value small, then it almost looks like an identity function. So if I can just sort of keep the S's in this range, Maybe it's a good idea. So initially, I was thinking in terms of Taylor series, and then I realized that I don't need to think asymptotically. I can actually take it to be exact. So um, a bit more why on um, to come on why I, I make this choice. But another way to view it is once once an S becomes a large value, then the a, um, a thresholding function essentially pegs it as a large value. So in this case, it would be pi pi um, the value pi over two. So it basically kills the variable. So even though there are lots of variables R, if I'm if I'm pegging some of them at pi, then I essentially lose that variable to the process. So I have a picture for that in a little bit. Okay, so the classic version of reservoir is to take a linear combination of um, the this process and the original variable. So a convex combination with an alpha, one minus alpha and alpha makes a convex combination. And when you write it like this, you're thinking of it, this is kind of like an update term, a little bit like if you're doing Euler's, me Euler's method or something for numerical integration. And that's a nice way to go. It slows down the reservoir. But it turns out it works even if you choose the, res um, the alpha equal to one, which kills this term and makes it so this is the only term you look at. And I'm going to do that too. So pretty soon I'm going to choose this, the alpha equal to one and the Q equal to S. 
anyway, when um, you are, I can just run the process like this and never read anything out. Just keep feeding in data and keep making new values of R. And um, the R's just keep up updating like this. And there's a very close relation, which I'm not going to cover here, to uh, uh, linear, control, linear control theory um, and observer theory in this. And there's a beautiful paper written by Boyd on that. Boyd, the optimization guy from Stanford. Um, on the op on the linear control theory and observers, not not of the connection RC. Um, but I choose to read out values because I want to get um, some kind of forecast, and I read them out by this line, which is a linear readout. I choose um, the W by some random process, so uniform is fine, random normal is fine. The A by a random process, I'm choosing the uniform distribution, but I'm going to train the W out matrix. So it's a DX by DR matrix. And remember, R is big, DX is small. So this would be like a three by thousand matrix. So that's the idea. I don't train all these. I just train the output guy versus a classic res, um, recurrent neural net where I try to train all of them to an objective function, which is typically best fit. I'm just going to train W out to best fit. Um, so the surprise is that even though these guys are random, it still works. So here's some notable literature, which I think is really beautiful and in parallel to what I do, and I'm very much informed by these guys. Gon and Ortega have a beautiful pair of papers in 2019 and 2020, which essentially say a reservoir computer enjoys a universal approximation theorem, which means it's able to represent a large category of data. Um, it's able to fit functions. Even if you have a linear reservoir with a nonlinear readout, and that's actually going to match the version I'm going to show you. Linear reservoir, nonlinear readout. When I say linear reservoir, I mean don't choose your activation function to be a nonlinear function. Choose it to be some kind of um, linear combinations, including, including the identity function. So I'm telling you it's related to VAR. So let me give you a little background on what's a VAR. VAR stands for vector autoregression. A reservoir computer is, is some kind of uh, RNN, a uh, recurrent neural net, but it relates to the classical VAR from econometrics and stochastic processes. <clears throat> a VAR is a vector version of an R, autoregression. Autoregression model, it can be written like this. So if I have a stochastic process, yt, yt minus one, yt minus two, back to infinity, and yt depends on its past values, as in terms of linear combinations like this with these coefficients, fees, um, I call it a, an autoregressive process. And this is a, um, a stochastic term. So usually in the R literature, autoregression literature, stochastic processes, you choose this to be Gaussian noise um, for white noise. And the Wold theorem tells you when you have such a representation. This is an RP because it depends on P past values, but you can certainly have an R infinity. And if I just show you a stochastic process, um, the existence theorem by Wold tells you when this representation exists. So here's two examples of R's on R1 and R2. The first one was generated by yt equals 18 minus 0.8 yt minus 1 plus epsilon. So you can see even though it looks linear, it's creating a pretty wild looking time series. This one's created by an R2, which is this one. It's called R2 because it depends on two previous values. This 2 is essentially telling you something about memory, memory in the process. So um, these can represent some pretty wild looking time series. So what the Wold theorem is for is if I just show you a time series and you would like to represent it by one of these kinds of guys, then uh, it says when you can do it. And there's usually a regression step in there. Um, I'm going to mostly skip this. So anyway, this is the fitting of a reservoir, a linear reservoir with a nonlinear readout. It does a superb job of fitting, as you can see. In fact, it also reproduces the attractor. This is for a uh, um, uh, uh, Lorentz, and it makes good errors, meaning once it makes starts making errors, you're still reproducing the climate. So it reproduces um, uh, plausible solutions. So the thing people do to make 
on the reservoir computer work better are um, are essentially phenomenological. They do things like choosing parameters and hyperparameters to, to by trial and error and some intuition to try to make it work better. The biggest one that people uh, I think do first is the I they choose A from a category of matrices. So emphasize sparsity, emphasize scaling, and also try to control spectral radius. So remember the A is this thing. So it, it's obvious that you might want to choose A to B um, to control the spectral radius because if with the spectral radius less than one, for example, it tends to make these R values not grow unbounded. Um, although even if this is growing unbounded, once I hit it with a nonlinear Q, that would tend to clip values that are growing so that they um, don't grow any larger. But then it tends to kill the values because once you get large values, you essentially peg them at the threshold where, um, you know, whatever the asymptotes. So that's obvious. What's less obvious is that um, sparse seems to work well. And it does, but I'm not going to bother with that because I'm going to instead choose a linear activation function and try to get at the heart of the matter. Um, so here we, I'm going to strip away and also better distributions for the read-in matrix. So also choosing by distributions. Choosing um, sparsity is like choosing a, uh, a, a, a mixture model. For example, if you choose a binomial mixture to Gaussian mixture with bounding, then you might control the spectral radius and sparse. Um, I'm going to strip away all that and just choose this by the uniform distribution I chose showed you and this by uniform distribution, and I'm going to try to make it work in a, a different way, not necessarily best. Um, so, so it may work worse, but it still works fantastically well. And then from there, I can improve it and explain it. So the punchline is going to be, um, it becomes directly comparable to the VAR. And once I understand what it is, I can improve it from there. The VAR is equivalent to a VMA, which is vector moving average. I have the Wold theorem. It's also like a DMD. Koopman method. And the equivalence will eventually lead me to NGRC, next generation reservoir. So the fitting process, okay, remember, we're doing this, we get our values on each step, reading in my data by the WN. On each step, I get an R value. So I can just collect all the R values I get in time in a big R matrix. And I have my true variables. Whatever it is, I'm trying to fit it to, so I can line them up. These are columns. Line them up as a big matrix. Um, so I like to read out my R values to match it to my uh, my target values. So a matrix V. Remember, this is going to be. Um, I forgot the size. It's going to be uh dx by dr so i'm calling v the v the w out matrix is essentially the v before i fitted it so v is just a matrix of the same size it goes from the many r values to the right number of y values which are essentially x's at the, at the readout so I'll, I'll call the w out the argmin of matching x to vr v times r in Frobenius norm so that'll be my loss function so minimizing this in Frobenius norm is a least squares problem. So here's the least squares problem written in matrix form. Here it is written column-wise in squares. So just train the output, and that's all you do. So a, um, a least squares problem has a matrix solution. Here's the matrix solution. Ignore this for a second. So this is essentially a Penrose pseudo-inverse, um, this RTR, RT inverse. Um, but we typically add in um, a small regularizer. This is um, a, uh, a ridge regression res regularizer. This is a solution of the of the Tychonized regularized problem with a small parameter alpha to keep it from overfitting. So it's a necessary step if you have many parameters to fit. Even though I have less parameters, there's still a lot of parameters in the W out matrix. If we want it to work very well, we don't want to overfit. Um, and it, there's a detail in my paper, which I'm not going to show here, but this thing can be written in terms of the uh, SVD of R, and the regularized version also can be written in terms of quotients with 1 over sigmas plus lambdas in the R instead of 1 over sigmas. 
in your um, in your pseudo inverse. Anyway, um, if I were to work this as a standard RC problem, I told you that one thing to notice is that the Q, if I were to expand one, um, a nice um, uh, nonlinear threshold function like this, you'll notice, of course, the leading term is um, identity, which just means that for small values of S, the curve becomes tangent to the identity function S. Um, Here's some actual data from a process. This process is the, um, the uh, Mackey glass differential delay equation. This talk isn't really about dynamical systems. It's about data-driven methods for dynamical systems. But this is a classic differential uh, uh, delay differential equation, which displays chaos. That differential delay equations are also infinite dimensional, a lot like um, a PDE is infinite dimensional. So it makes a nice platform for testing your, your um, machine learning method. Anyway, just take this as data. Somebody gave it to me, you can say. And here's a time zoom of the same data. So this is a shorter time range. This is also X. Just feeding X into my reservoir. Um, so just one value. Um, and training it to the output. I'm just going to show you a picture of the R's. So in this case, there were a thousand R's. So if I show you all thousand R's, this is R versus time, in the same time range as this X, um, it'd be too many to show you. That makes a big mess if I try to show you a thousand time series at once. So this is about um, 10 time series. And you'll notice that some of the R's are hanging out really close to 0.4, but mostly they're also oscillating. So um, it's the A in this um, guy that keeps them from growing too large. So if I made an A too large, meaning the spectral radius is too large, it would tend to grow the Rs so that the Rs are getting close to where the, um, the tan saturates. And in this plot, what you would see is a bunch of these time series become essentially um, stuck at uh, pi over two or minus pi over two. And that would be a signature that I've trained a bad, or I've developed a bad reservoir computer, and I shouldn't be doing that. And so I, I may have a thousand different R values, but most of them are sort of dead to the uh, the machine learning process. So that's what this does. So then you might say, well, maybe I do a better job if I make the spectral radius not too large, so that when I look at this picture, they kind of sm stay near small values instead of saturating at pi over two. And so, good, but now I say, okay, but if I'm really just trying to stick between 0.4 and minus 0.4 is what ends up happening, that's in this range where the tang doesn't really look much like a nonlinear function. It looks more like the S. That's where I started. So I said, okay, if that's all I'm doing, let's just skip all that stuff and try out just the S. Well, once I did that, I said, okay, let's just make the activation function exactly um, the identity function and see what happens. Since it's now, I'm just for a moment, I say it's exactly the identity function. I can just update the R's, that internal variable of the reservoir, exactly. So choosing R1 to be zero, then AR1 plus U1 equals, okay, that's zero. So it's just U1. U1 is read in, W in, X1. I don't bother hitting it with the Q, or I do, but it's invisible because it's identity function, and I'm done. R2 is just Wn x1. R3 is going to be A times R2. That's R2. I have it. Plus the new value. The new value is read in the data, x2. Um, and uh, R2 is Wn x1. So I hit that with A. And that's R3. It's A, W, and X1 plus W and X2. And we can just keep going. R4, iterate. A, R3 plus U3. And I can just put all the terms in from the previous iteration. This is the power of just choosing Q to be identity. So you can see it's easy. I start picking up a nice pattern. R4 is A squared W and X1 plus A, W and X2 plus A, A. 
There is no A here where I can think of as A to the zero power is identity matrix. W and X3. See, so R4 depends on X1, X2, X3. That's the memory. I can just keep going like this. RK plus one, stick that in, iterate, and you get a nice pattern. And you see the pa pattern, RK plus one has powers of A, powers of A, and decreasing powers. Um, Wn times x1, x2, through xk. So the rk plus 1 depends on all the previous xks, but the oldest one, the x1, has powers of A. And the powers of A, if you're good with um, the numerical analysis of matrices, you know the powers of A would um, essentially take this vector and increase it to infinity if the spectral radius is large and shrink it to zero if the spectral radius is not large. So you want to kind of keep this at, with a spectral radius of a medium value. So that's the first pattern. So RK plus one is a nice series. Continuing with that, <clears throat> W out, I want to read it out to a new, to a, a value I'll match again to data. W out the RK plus one, since RK plus one was the series, I hit it with W out. And everything's linear because it's matrix operations. I've just chose Q to be identity function. And I get this expression, right? W out AK to minus one, W in X1. W out AK minus two, W in X2. So the data W, w X1, X2 through K, XK minus one, XK is, is touched with these matrices, which are, that guy's chosen randomly. That guy's pre-chosen randomly. This guy I train, W out. Um, remember, this guy's not square. This guy is square. This guy is not square, but the transpose size of this one. So this is a square matrix of the size X1. So if X1 was, say, 3 by 1, this is a 3 by 3 matrix. And these are all 3 by 3 matrices, which I'm now going to write as AK, AK minus 1. A, A2, A1, and each of these AJs is this thing A, with the uh, power A to the power in the middle. So I could choose the A randomly and train the output, or you can just train the A's directly. If I train the A's directly and I look at this thing sideways, it looks a lot like to me um, linear combinations of the X's and I realized, you know what? That's a vector autoregression I'm looking at right there. So the yk plus 1 is a linear combination of the x's, but where you're adjusting them with matrices A, perhaps with some noise added. And if I explicitly write some noise added, that is a var k. Remember, var stands for vector. So if this was not vector, if this was scalar, if x was scalar, the x size were scalar, then this would be a number, a scalar, or a one by one matrix, and I would call it an R. But since these are vectors, these like this is three by one, then this is a three by three, and I have all these matrices to fit. It's a vector autoregression. So I'm just identifying it as a vector autoregression. I'll show you how to train it in a second as a vector autoregression. Yeah. But this means that I can dip into this really well developed um, literature from econometrics from the 1960s. Um, through today, 1970s and so forth, the stochastic processes. So already working the problem this way, it works pretty well. It helps me explain it, but also um, it's the explaining it that's fantastic, but I can make it work better. Now, there's another piece of literature that this connects me to, which is called, Ar um, in numerical analysis, especially for PDEs, this is actually what's called an Arnoldi iteration. When you have powers of matrices like this, AK minus one, AK minus two, A through A, like that, you're iterating in a space that corresponds to um, the eigenvectors of A, and you're, it really essentially corresponds to rotating arbitrary vectors along dominant directions. And that is studied um, in great detail in the control linear control theory, and it's called Arnoldi iteration, and you're working in a Krylov space. That's uh, K-R-Y-L-O-V, Krylov space. Um, anyway, 
um, accumulating all that for all the data. So this equation is equivalent to this equation where I'm just going to stack all my vectors y and I'm going to stack all my vectors x and uh, remember, remind myself what are the unknowns here. The unknowns here are the a's and a's are hitting all the x's, right? So look at this equation and I'll show you the next equation. These two equations are the same. See, so a multiplies xk, a2 multiplies xk minus 1, through ak multiplies x1. So one row like this, by a column like this, um, is one of the lines from the last equation, from the last uh, problem that would match to the xk uh, plus 1. Y, to me, the yk plus 1 is an xk plus 1. Uh, and I do that successively through all the data, which I accumulate in stacks like this, and I can get all the data like this. So remember, this is xk through x1, xk plus 1 through x2, right? So there's, um, I see a lot of repetition here along the diagonals like that. Um, this is my, all my x data in a memory full version. These are matrices. So this would be, um, uh, these are 3 by 3 matrices. So this is 3 by k times 3. So this thing matches like this. And now I can just think of fitting this complete matrix also by least squares. You can show that the fitted best A directly is this thing. This is just the ridge regression with these matrices. And I write this thing in terms of the regularized pseudo inverse. And that's in my paper, how to represent that directly by singular values, but it's just representing that thing. So look what I just did. I'm doing the linear reservoir which you could have done by choosing the A randomly and the W in randomly, and then trying to fit the W out, and then doing all these steps. Um, or knowing this equation right here, so that's the reservoir way to do it. But knowing this equation um, and the match to a VAR, I could just fit the A's directly because what would I do with the, 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 the this A and this W in? And once I fitted the W out, I would essentially be forming the A's where, whether I realized the equivalence or not. So why not just fit the A's directly? So that's what this says. It's this equivalence. And the AJ's are this thing. So following my nose on that concept, the W outs are um, equivalent to one. If I knew the A's, which is this A matrix, which f is filled with all these A's, times this x um, scripty, which is that all the, all the data stacked in this funny way, matched to the y. Um, the w out, I can read it as a star a transpose, or a pseudo inverse. So I can pull out the, the w out if I want it, or I can just do the forecasting directly from the a's. Anyway, the two are equivalent, because I can make this relationship. And oh, by the way, this a scripty, is now going to be the a's written in this form right so w in a w in through a k minus one w in it's everything except for left multiplying by the w out and this is interesting because you can see i'm doing a column wise or arnoldi iteration on these matrices w in so arnoldi iteration is the word of the day there so if i do just that with the linear um, regression and the linear activation. So that's Q of X equals X and a linear readout. I said it works pretty well already for forecasting. So this is what forecasting looks like for Lorentz doing just that with linear activation and a reservoir of size a thousand, except I'm essentially not going to use that because I'm just going to directly do it this way. You can do it both ways. You'll see you get exactly the same thing because they are the same thing. So you can see I forecast pretty well for a little while, right? The blue is almost on top of the red. And this is a picture of the errors. The error stays pretty small until the error grows. And once it grows, it, it essentially becomes terrible. Um, once it becomes terrible, um, the kinds of errors I make aren't the right kind of errors. It's not reproducing the attractor. So this is a picture of the red as if it were a delay attractor. So this, this is that picture. And it doesn't look like an orange butterfly to me. 
So it does well. I call that decent because I see good forecasts, but not fantastic, which is the big surprise that it reproduces the attractor. So I'm going to improve improve it in this for a second, in a second, but already I think that's kind of neat. I've showed an equivalent between um, the reservoir computing with linear activation and linear readout to VAR. But now I'm going to improve it and make, go from decent to superb by now making it into an NVAR, nonlinear vector autoregression. So this is what pretty well looks like. This is what fantastic looks like. So fantastic with what I'm going to show you in a second. It, it, it does good forecasts for longer. And once it starts making errors, the errors are good errors, reproduces the attractor, right? So I'm forecasting well out to say several of the up and up times. Here's forecasting well for a bit fewer of the up and up times and reproduces the attractor. Um, I'm going kind of slower than I, I, I intend. I always seem to be able to do that. So this is the wall theory in the background before I show you the NGRC stuff and the uh, NVAR stuff, but there's this really well-developed world theory that says it's about which time series of a stochastic process admits this kind of representation right here. And the punchline is, is if you show me a, a stochastic process psi t, and the stochastic process um, uh, it has, um, is, where's my words? Um, is white noise, here it is. Uh, psi t is white noise. So it's a kind of completely random process. This You just keep choosing psi t from a white noise process. Just keep choosing it. Then this represents a, a, a vector moving average. So this thing c is a delay matrix. So here's an example of a delay, a finite delay matrix. So the matrix written with this, with this notation L and delays really says split it up into two matrices where you multiply the L, this is C0, this is C1, C0, C1, plus a delay. And the delay picks up um, a, say, a vector X, T, and then offsets it by like say T to T minus one. So when I write this times this, it really means this vector delay uh, process. So that's a legitimate way to write an XT, but I'm doing the delays on the noise itself. So when you say XT is linear combinations of past noises, and it's all that form, I call it a moving average, moving average of the noise. And Wold tells us you have such a representation for a stochastic process that's completely just noise. Um, if um, the offset is um, predetermined, you have white noise. The coefficient matrices are square summable. That's very that's a very mild assumption. The first guy's identity matrix, and mu t by the way is called an innovation uh, innovation. So this is all the range of stochastic processes. Anyway. A VMA can be turned into a um, AR by taking this matrix and inverting it to the left if the inversion exists. So if I invert it to the left, I take linear combinations of the, of the time series itself equals one delay. So this is what's called an R or a vector autoregression. And that's what's running in the background. So what I take from this is when I showed you an RC is equivalent to a vector autoregression, then this theorem allows me to say, great, then if I give you a stochastic process, when do I expect the VAR to exist? When this tells me so, and therefore that tells me when I expect the effect, the RC to, and RC to exist that will represent the data. So we have an existence theorem. And I think that was lacking in the field before that. I have more details on this in, my, in that paper, but that's the idea of it. I also said it's related to Koopman Remember I wrote this out in the vector form? Koopman theory basically tells you that the next values are related to the previous values by a, um, uh, a linear operator. DMD is a finite rank representation of that linear operator. It's a push forward. And you typically stick all the data in columns in this manner. So this is um, a delayed version of the vector data X matches to a delayed version of the vector data X 
but do you notice you advance the x by one and otherwise in delays? So it's slightly different from what I wrote for my var because this is essentially this upper left column. So you can see there's kind of a strong analogy between fitting this and fitting this. Um, so in a way, the a's are just almost the k from doing um, Koopman or DMD when you fit this for the finite rank version. And I can finish this analogy with some matrix manipulations, but I'm not going to do that here. So anyway, this matrix fit to k is done in the DMD literature by, again, doing the least squares as your loss function in Frobenius norm. So k looks like this with that being uh, the spec, uh, the Penrose pseudo inverse. So it's a very strong analogy to, to Koopman as well in the DMD literature. Um, I want to I want to point out there's a concept of fading memory here with the A's. So you remember, okay, the A's. So back here, I pointed out in this that the A's can be written out just as this equation. Each A is just this equation. So if I want to tell you how big is the A matrix, I can just say take the A in norm and match it to this guy in norm. And if these A's fade off in time, so in other words, if these A's become very small for the early data, when I want to match it to the new data, xk plus one, then I would just say really the old stuff is less important. And maybe the new stuff is more important if the A1 is bigger than the A2 is bigger than the all the way back to the old stuff. So maybe instead of having match, having to match it to its complete history, if I only need to match it to the past several few, then that would tell me that um, there's a fading memory. Otherwise, I have a complete memory. And that's what I'm after here. I'm going to say, let's take this A in norm and match it to this stuff, which would be what the equation says. So the kind of norm I'm using here is called um, nuclear norm. And the nuclear norm is related to um, the singular values of A. But this kind of equation is true in any natural norm. Um, anyway, in norm, you can break this up into an inequality in terms of each of the matrices separately. And... Um, then again, you can pull out the J minus one by inequality again and say the norm of this guy. And then it tells me that, okay, look at the, uh, the norm of this guy and raise it to powers. So one thing you might realize immediately is um, this norm is bounded by its largest singular value, which is again bounded by um, the, uh, the um, spectral radius and two norm or the, 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 uh, the matrix norm, uh, as a natural two norm is related to the spectral radius of this guy. So anyway, so asking this question of memory for different kind of fitted process, you can see the fitted AKs, um, they tend to fall off. So here it is fitted for many through 10. And you can see by the time you get to six, these quantities become so, so small, they really don't matter much. Uh, for Lorenz process, because of a little bit of noise, by 10, they fall off a lot, but there's some uh, oscillation near zero, all the way up to about 40. So in one sense, you'll get a good fit by 10. In another sense, you'll get a better fit out to 40. But anyway, there's a fading memory. So this is my fading memory story. And I talk about that in a lot more detail again in my paper. Uh, Eric, uh, you have about 10 more minutes. And, good. Yeah. I can finish this nicely in about 10 minutes. Yeah. And uh, maybe people would have... So, a few questions. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, I, I can finish. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe you could allow two, three minutes for questions. We'll just okay, see. I can finish this in about six or seven minutes. Um, here's a trick that leads to the nonlinear thing. The trick is instead of fitting it to the R data inside the reservoir, you add in um, a second matrix R that's built out of the R's by you do pointwise multiplication. So, if R is a thousand by one matrix, this says do um, R, like R first component times R first component, R second component times R second component. So when you, so that's like pointwise multiplication. This is equivalent if you like MATLAB, it's like the dot times arithmetic. So this is formally called the Hadamard product. So if you stack Hadamard products of the R's like this, it would be of the same um, uh, size as the R's and you fit it to that. So this is quadratic stuff. So 
this dot times version of it, you fit a W out um, to the complete guy. So the W out splits. And otherwise, I read where I read out in this augmented R. So the augmented R again is the old R plus square stuff. But the square stuff is pointwise arithmetic. So it turns out there's a trick here that I found in that paper of mine that if you do this Hadamard product, and I really remember each of these is hit by a matrix, then I can ask, take a vector and a matrix and Hadamard by the readout matrix times the, the vector, do that. And if I write matrix times vector as this trick, which is saying, um, take the components of W and multiply by the columns of B. So any matrix times vector can be written as a linear combination of the columns of the of the matrix. That's what this says, right? So W's is the matrix as the vector, and B's BI's are the columns of the matrix B. So if I do that, same thing because that's what I have because that's what's in the R's after I do a readout, then. Um, then following my nose on the readouts, it ends up being all, all terms in W. So W1 times W1, W1 times W2, W1 times W3, W2 times W1. So a matrix of all Ws. So all quadratic terms, all monomials in W. So that's what you get if you're doing this fitting, which is what um, you do up here. So if you do that, so if I fit this is what I do the reservoir way, you realize that you're fitting all coefficients of this guy. So following your nose on that takes a bit of algebra to write it out in formal form. But just like before, where I said, okay, feed in your A and follow through all those fits, um, you can show that you end up getting all quadratic, a matrix of all quadratic forms times um, the, the data in all quadratic forms. This is a quadratic fit. And P2 is just all quadratic terms. So it makes a big mess, ugly mess to look at, but it's a very simple thing. Um, when I do R's and the fitted guy, a lot like before, you get a big matrix of all the all the quadratic terms and a vector of all the, all the quadratic terms. And you can show a punchline that if I stack the data like this and I stack all the data like this, which this thing is very big. It's a big vector. That's the vector of data. This is the vector of the data in all quad quadratic monomials and columns. Then the fitted term is the um, vector autoregression stuff plus something like vector autoregression, but in all quadratic terms, all quadratic monomials. And a model like this, I call an NVAR, nonlinear vector autoregression. So that's an equivalence that shows it's equivalent to an NVAR. And I've argued before that it fits really well. So you can do vector, um, so this was just for the analysis, but don't do it this way. There's a little trick we have in our nature communications paper that shows you that since there's an equivalence between a, a linear RC with a nonlinear readout, there's an implicit NVAR um, when you do um, this kind of reservoir computing and the NGRC is a way of realizing that implicit NVAR um, directly. Um, and it's a lot less data hungry to do that. And here's the trick. I'm going to stop with this trick. Um, but you can pick up all the nonlinear terms. Instead of forming them explicitly like I showed you a minute ago, this is the trick we thought of in the, um, in the NGRC paper, now Next Generation Reservoir Computing. It's to take all the, the vector of the linear terms and um, Kronecker product it to the same stuff in columns. And if I if I multiply iterate the Kronecker product, I can pick up all the, the quadratics, all the cubics, whatever you want in a very simple way. So if you do Kronecker product, um, you'll get multiples. So this little hook guy up here means um, only take the unique. So just find, find all the unique terms. So if you were doing this in MATLAB, there's a cron term. And then you can just say unique. So this operation can be done in one in one line in MATLAB instead of thinking of doing it this way, which would take a lot of programming. Anyway, um, doing that, this is the kind of the storyboard I'll take as the conclusion of this talk. So the storyboard says 
Um, the traditional way, I take my data, feed it into a reservoir, I do my fit, and I may do good forecasting. But if I choose my um, my uh, uh, threshold function to be linear, and I fit to um, a nonlinear readout, I can instead just directly fit the end var, and I can do it with this trick I said. So what you want to do is form linear features of the data, like x and all of its delays, y and all of its delays, form um, this thing that's built out of maybe quadratic and, and more terms by that trick with the chronic or product and unique, fit that directly, and you'll get the same thing up to numerical precision. And it works fantastically well, and it works much cheaper than doing it the direct reservoir way and with essentially no parameters to tune. So all that random stuff, it goes away and it works fantastically well. So I'm gonna stop with this because I ran out of time, maybe with one tease. So you can do it also with other kinds of variants. You can fit it to say a model where you're just sensing X and Y and maybe have it forecast just the Z. You can do control through this. You can do, we've done, um, you know, earth science of this and, and forecast um, sea surface temperature. But I better stop here because you can see I can go on and on and on and on, which I tend to do. And we'll leave this for questions. So thank you for having me. Yeah, it was it was a very nice pedagogic talk, and I it's very I hope you don't mind it going on to our to the website because I'm sure people will find it very very useful. Uh, may I start with a question? Certainly. Uh, yeah. All the time scales that you have talked of. Uh, are any of them those related to the Lyapunov times? If you said something about it in the beginning, but then uh, afterwards I kind of lost track. <laughs> so I didn't. I didn't use Lyapunov time explicitly for telling you about how long to forecast, but yeah. I, I mentioned Lyapunov time. This is really the proper conclusion: yeah. is I should score how well I'm forecasting, not based on um, natural time, right. but on Lyapunov time. Yeah. Because sensitive dependence will take two nearby initial conditions and push them apart at yeah. a scale of the of time. And that's the best I can hope for. Yeah. So that's a that's a post hoc way of scoring you know, the up and up time. Yeah. But um, in a sense, um, the memory of the process is also related to the up and up time. And that's in that inequality I showed you. And so um, um, in a very strong way, the A becomes related, the A, that A matrix I was telling you about becomes related to the Lyapunov of time. And then the memory of how much um, past um, terms to be fitting is also related to the Lyapunov of time. So it's implicit um, in, in the, the fitting process, but it's important. Oh, but there's no precise, there's no way of making a precise estimate of how it is related to the Lyapunov of time. I mean, there's- Oh, there is. It's just, I haven't written about it. So you're touching on some stuff that I've been playing around with, like e even currently. Okay. <laughs> a superb question. Uh, maybe you could just tell us in two oh, there, So there is. It's yeah. just that um, it's not out there. Um, but I, I kind of basically already said it. The That inequality is telling you what, what the history is, what okay. the memory is. The memory. Yeah. That yeah. memory should be related to Lyapunov time. So the way that memory curve falls off should also be related to um, to Lyapunov time. And that should help you choose how much memory to choose. Uh, but it's some fraction of the Lyapunov time or the Lyapunov time itself? Well, the Lyapunov time isn't really like a single number. So right. yeah, it's, it's going right. to be a constant times Lyapunov time. But Lyapunov time is just basically saying how many, how many, um, a Lyapunov time is just the time uh, of one over lambda Lyap, um, Actually, the Lyapunov number um, is related to Lyapunov time. Lyapunov number is um, they're related by L if lambda's Lyapunov exponent um, log of Lyapunov number r uh, is Lyapunov um, exponent, and you just that comes in the time scale of seconds, so you just yes. call one of those Lyapunov time. Um, so how how many how many multiples of that is right. Lyapunov horizon? So essentially, yeah. one of the exploit. 
Okay. Because you know, like the lambda multiplies the d in the exponent e, the lambda t. So um, if lambda is the thing that multiplies it, you see, if I call t equal to one, say then then lambda would be one lambda time. Okay. Uh, uh, my second question is, how much of a role does the linearization play? You know. Oh, you okay. saw in the end it doesn't play much at all because. Okay. I mean, you. It is a different reservoir computer. I can do reservoir computing with a nonlinear activation function, but then I should choose which one. Should I choose, hyper, choose hyperbolic tangent? Should I choose sigmoid? Should I choose ReLU? And it turns they all they all work pretty well. And then when I tune the um, the distributions, I choose all those hyperparameters. I do the fitting, and so and there's a there's a dirty secret in reservoir computing that even though you're choosing the parameters randomly and usually it works. Sometimes you get a dud matrix A. It just doesn't work. And no one really understood why. I or I can choose um, the linear activation function, and it also works. But you get different matrices. So I showed you that also works um, with the nonlinear readout. But um, now with that one, I can explain what's going on. And with the other ones, I can't as well explain what's going on. So, so we um, might as well stick to the linearity. Right. Right. You can you stick to the linear because if you stick to the linear with the nonlinear readout, it's my experience that it's less data hungry. Okay. And then you should just do it the NGRC way because there's no random anything. It's 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 an implicit becomes an implicit RC, but it takes less data for the, the training phase, and it, it works fantastically well. And that's the topic of that. Um, I'm just going to show that um, nature communications paper from last year. Like we're just doing this all the time now because every time with the short data sets we get from real process, this works better than doing um, th this roundabout way through the reservoir computer. And why? Because I think it's just you're multiplying lots of numbers. You have to make these big matrices. You mix up the data in funny ways. You take combinations of them. And after all that, I think there's some numerical imposition that floats in. And anyway, it works well to do it that way, but not as well as just doing it this direct way. So one more thing, the network architecture plays almost no role, right? Because you are choosing all the connections randomly. Right, exactly. The network architecture is not nearly as important as people have been exploring. Um, and so what I want to say on that is if you have one good matrix A, then you would expect maybe some nearby matrix A might be good, but not necessarily all of them. In the A space, there's a manifold of good A's. So while we're searching for those A's, um, most of them work, but some of them don't. There's a null space of bad A's. But anyway, since I can boil it out and basically fit out the A anyway and show you the equivalent of one of the better A's, then don't bother with that. Um, the the architecture is less important than you than most people think. Uh, that's interesting. You tend to think it would be right. I mean, it's, uh, right. Yeah. Another way to say it is this thing here is just going after. There are bad A's. There's A's where it doesn't work, and there are A's where it works less well than others. Right. If you're going that way, okay. but yeah. this thing is essentially going after one of the better A's, and it's implicit. So if there's a best A. Um, then this just is just saying it shows that and you never see it because it's um, it, it boils out in the fitting process. Um, okay, I think uh, oh, we can still manage one or two questions from other people. I have seen mm -hmm. to have asked all of them. Uh, anybody? I, I think Xavier has, wants to ask a question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for, for the nice talk. And actually, we were quite interested uh, because we actually implemented uh, part of it in, uh, in Reservoir Pi, this uh, new work. And so one of my questions would be, so to, <clears throat> to what kind of tasks could it, could it extend that? Could it work, for example, with some uh, uh, canary data or with, in general, tasks that has uh, more dimension than a few dimension, like 40 dimensions, for instance. Yes. Yeah. So, but what was the, you, you said some kind of data, I missed the word. 
bird song data, so like or speech in general, like, like oh, French, speech only? Like MFCC yeah. representation. We, we haven't tried ones. speech, but I don't see any reason speech shouldn't work because we have we are working some very. Does this work? No, I can't make it run. I don't know what's wrong. This was supposed to be um, Earth, <laughs> so it's a PD, but we don't. It's actually just raw data from sea surface temperature. I don't know why does it work. No, sorry. Um, anyway, it's very high dimensional. So in principle, it's supposed to fit the whole thing, but then um, it's already very high dimensional. So then the uh, fitting to it, it just becomes too big a matrix to do the least square step. So what we do is we break it up into lots of little reservoirs that are coupled by a patching system. And uh, with the idea that there's, there's a, a cone of influence as that's st standard PDE stuff. So nothing from far away could be influencing this anyway. So don't do a global fit that would accommodate that. So there's some standard tricks that can help you handle extremely high dimensional data. But speech data, I think is more likely scalar. So that's a bit more like the delay differential and um, differential delay equation I showed you from uh, um, Lesota Mackey. And in that one, I, I, would, I would hope the history isn't tremendously long, but if it, but if it were, you might have like numerical imprecision um, difficulties. But I, I'm going to guess that's not going to happen because we were able to work with different delay equations that are real, that are essentially, uh, in principle, infinite dimensional. I, I doubt that the speech has an infinite history. If it did, then then it would sort of be out of touch, even though the theory would still work. No, no, you can have a yeah, short, short history. Uh... So see, mathematically, you can imagine a data set I couldn't handle, one with an, in, with an infinite history, because uh, the, the fitting would be to become too large a problem, and I would need too much data. And may, maybe then the language, like if you try to find long-term differences, maybe, in the language. So, yeah, maybe that's... Uh, okay. Thank Good you for question. your... I would be very curious what 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 you're doing with speech if uh, if you'd send me an email because that sounds very exciting. Okay, I'll send you an email. Uh, I have one question. Hmm? Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, Xavier. No worries. Oh, okay, I have one question. You mentioned that uh, the the errors that we get is still good errors. So I yes. could not, I did not see what is the mathematics behind that. I mean, I, I missed. Yeah. I, I, I didn't show you mathematics, but um, I, I, I asserted it in my paper. Um, so let's say I've got one dynamical system and I have another dynamical system. And I say like they, they do the same thing. What do I mean by reproduce the climate? So I'm, the assertion is that the invariant measure of this guy is the same as the invariant measure of this guy. So this is a dynamical system, it's the reservoir, and it's a, a dynamical system unto itself. And if I say that, okay, um, forecasting is one thing, so they match the forecast, and I'm happy with that, that's all that was done for fitting. But on the side, I say the invariant measures here are the same. So think of probability distributions. How do you match probability distributions? So I can take, I can ask, what's the kolbach lieber divergence between this probability di distribution and this probability distribution? That's, that's a nice measure for um, comparing two probability distributions. But that's, that's, that's the, the, whatever my, my um, whatever my divergence between two probability distributions, I, I, I essentially think of this as a probability distribution, this is a probability distribution, and I ask that they be same, if I say that really exactly reproduce the climate. Yeah, but where are we imposing that? I mean, nowhere- I'm not I, imposing it. We are not I'm just, imposing I'm just it. observing it. I'm saying, um, this is post hoc. I'm saying, look at that. This looks the same as that. So okay. looking the same as my eyeball. So to my eyeball, that looks the same. But yeah, afterwards, yeah. I say, can I make that a bit more precise? So what do I mean by they're the same? So um, it means the attractors are the same. So what I mean by the attractors, I say, I have the statistics. The invariant measure is the same, is a, is a stronger way to say that. So what's really surprising is just by fitting... Um, a, um, a good reservoir to the data um, based on a loss function that's only based on um, fit quality of the of the time series in L2, you get something really surprising as a bonus. It's shockingly exciting is that the invariant measures attract, but that's not in the training at all. 
So it, it, we don't know why it is happening. Is that what you're trying to say? Right. It's still unknown why it's happening. It's just look at look at that. It is happening. Yeah, it's happening. But yeah, okay. See. Very exciting. I think very nice. Yeah. Thank you. So, anybody else? Oh, I see a question online. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, that's. Uh... Oh, someone asked me about JDeep. I don't know what JDeep is. So I guess it means I'm not logged in, JDeep. <laughs> right. This is, uh, okay, we are looking for the next speaker who seems to oh. be. Oh, I see. That's his name. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a software package. I'm sorry, JDeep. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay, anybody? <laughs> uh, but... Since Jaydeep hasn't shown up yet, maybe you could, if you wanted to make any additional comment, please feel free. Um, I wanna, I wanna say you guys, everyone should look at that paper by um, Gonin and um, and pa Pablo that I, I mentioned early on. It's really fantastic because. It's not a constructive theory, but it's very much parallel to what I say. So they say it in, RC enjoys a universal approximation theorem. Um, so that means linear and nonlinear, linear with a nonlinear readout. They say universal approximation. So they're saying that I should be able to do such a thing as I did. They just don't, it doesn't tell us how it would be done. Um, you really want a new universal approximation theorem in any machine learning area with neural nets. And uh, until they came along, it was not clear that it would exist for reservoirs. So what we do is equivalent to their linear with nonlinear readout. There's a second story in this that I'm pursuing. I have a few slides on it, but there's not enough time to go through them. Um, I'll post them though, that they also pursue. And there's a story about um, random projection. There's a beautiful theory about what does data look like in high dimensions called concentration of measure. And the star theorem in concentration of measure is the johnson lindenstrauss theorem that tells us about random projections um, uh, are an approximate isometry. That means nearby points in the high dimensional space are still nearby in the low dimensional space, even if you choose the, the projection randomly. And there's a version of interpreting all this in that story too. And or Gordon and Ortega have been pursuing it, and so have I. So it's kind of another version of the same story, a different kind of analysis. Um, but if you let me, I can go on for hours. So um, I, I can comment and comment, but maybe I shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> maybe not for hours, but for <laughs> five minutes we do have. How about that? <laughs> you want me to show you um, what is random projection? Sorry? I can show you what is random projection. Yes, please. I wonder why, okay, let me turn off my little pointer because I don't think that's why I can't. Um, hmm. It's my pointer that doesn't let me, there was a beautiful picture I'd wanted to show you of doing the reservoir computing thing for earth science. So we have this paper with a student that we're forecasting earth really well, the earth sea temperature. Earth's sea surface temperature from satellites, but I can't show you that. Here's concentration of measure. This is a slide from a book on the topic of concentration of measure by these fellows, Masuk. Um, and it's really, it's really weird. So as soon as we have lots of data in high dimensions, it doesn't look anything like our intuition because um, we live in 3D world. So if you have the rents and um, it, well, let's say the sea surface temperature data. It was several thousand values at each time step. So I think of each time step as one point in a thousand dimensional space. Um, and then each, then lots of time samples would be like a data cloud in a thousand dimensional space. So when I think of a thousand dimensional space, I'm thinking my, my intuition thinks of data spread out like a 3D data cloud, but it's spread out in a very different way. So here's a little story that helps you understand that. So think of um, think of a sphere, a real sphere with a surface 
Um, so this is the 2D sphere, like the surface of the Earth. And if I want to paint it with paint, say up to a height h, but I'm on the surface. So I show me show me 90% of the sphere. So that would be 100%. Show me that bit of the sphere. So how much paint would I need? What fraction of paint? So in three dimensions, which means the two-dimensional sphere, this is 90% of the sphere, that um, gray area. And that's how much paint I would need. So strangely, if I do the same game, um, show me the height that captures 90% of that area for in 11 dimensions for the 10 dimensional 2d the 10 dimensional surface um this is it that's the uh, 90 percent band in 101 dimensions that's the 90 percent band and you can show that very rigorously so guess what happens as um the dimension goes to infinity is this converges to um the the, the hyperplane at the equator which is really weird. So it means if I have a probability distribution and I'm sprinkling points on the sphere in high dimension, um, you would expect that they would distribute themselves um, all around it like that. This is our 3D um, intuition. But really, um, most distributions, they distribute themselves in a way that's basically kind of flat. That means, that means there's a reduced order model and um, I don't need to be very careful to choose that reduced order model because the data is really mostly flat anyway. So if I just project this down to a, a low dimension, I'm projecting off what's mostly like a plane. And that's the punchline in this fancy theorem called johnson lindenstrauss theorem. Um, in high dimensions, samples look of data look almost flat, and they live in a flat space um, that we can pick almost randomly. So this is the idea of that theorem. Um, so distribute your data in the high dimensional space, like a thousand dimensions or a million dimensions. Um, and if my algorithm depends on comparing points as a least squares algorithm does, that really means it's depending on distances between points. Well, I don't really need all, all the dimensions because Johnson Lindenstrauss tells us that a projection, and in fact, any projection, almost any projection will do a random projection to a lower dimensional subspace, I get almost the same distance in that low dimensional space. And that's how you write that. I see. So for a much lower dimensional um, space than the original, distances in, in that subspace are almost equal to the original distances. Um, if this were epsilon were zero, I would say equal. If it's not, I call it not an isometry, but an approximate isometry. So this is the formal statement of that. Right, so the way you say appro approximate isometry is by these inequalities, one minus epsilon, one plus epsilon. And this is a formal statement of, of the johnson lindenstrauss theorem that there is a projection function that does that. And there's one more piece that's really weird. The dimension I can project down to depends logarithmically on the sample. You don't see the dimension, the original dimension in there. You see something logarithmically on the sample size and the, and the precision I want. So these numbers can be much smaller than these numbers. So that stuff about um, that stuff about a readout matrix, it's essentially kind of like one of these. And um, there's another version of that theorem that says um, that that readout matrix can be selected randomly, and you capture um, you capture well in high high precision. This starts looking a lot like a, a Markov inequality. It's actually a category of theorem called a, a Chernoff inequality. So in analysis, this is also a way of getting after a lot of stuff in um, in information theory. You can derive or, or think of it in terms of Johnson and Lindenstrauss, but we can also think about uh, why does reservoir compute it and work so well? It's because the data doesn't really do a good job of spreading itself out in those high dimensions. There's gonna be a reduced order model that makes it work really well. And also in the DMD stuff, I just finished a student, um, a Sudam, and this is his long name, um, randomized projection learning methods for dynamic mode decomposition, which is closely related to, um, as I showed you, to uh, the reservoir computing, um, where we do all the fitting in a randomly sampled or randomly projected 
version of the problem. So this is kind of another hint of why reservoir computing works so well. Um, uh, one more thing I want to mention is if you've heard about um, if you've heard about compressed sensing, compressed sensing is also all the rage and sparsity and all that. This is kind of a why sparsity and compressed sensing works so well. I see. Okay. I better stop here though. Uh, but this was pretty interesting, but maybe another day. And uh, so thank you so much. And uh, by the way, we hope you will be able to make it. I mean, you showed us a geodesic and the geodesic to here is pretty far, but uh, yes. But see, next year we are planning to have a physical conference. So I hope it would be great if you could actually, you know, travel along the geodesic and get here. Let's see. <laughs> so it's not impossible. Well, thank you. Um, my wife and my son are being persuaded by our neighbor who is Indian to come visit them at their uh, at their spot. And my youngest son is like really good at languages. He speaks 15 languages. And uh, um, uh, uh, does he, does he have Tamil in his repertoire? <laughs> so uh, it's not impossible. So, so yes, please. Thank you. And I can't promise I can, but I might. I might be yeah, able yeah. to. Interesting. Thank keep, you. Keep a slot for us in July.